Hello everybody and welcome to True Hope Cast, the official podcast of True Hope Canada, where we take a deep dive into mental health's many physiological and psychological aspects. This is the show for you if you're looking for motivation, inspiration, knowledge and solutions, and that's what we're all about here at True Hope Canada. True Hope Canada is a mind and body based supplement company dedicated first and foremost to promoting brain and body health through non-invasive nutritional means. For more information about us, please visit truehopecanada.com. Today, I welcome Sally Norton to the podcast. Now, Sally is a distinguished expert in dietary oxalates with 35 years of health education and research experience. She holds a nutrition degree from Cornell University and a master's degree in public health from the University of North Carolina. Her personal healing experience inspired years of research culminating in the release of her groundbreaking book, Toxic Superfoods. Today, we're going to be discussing oxalate overload and toxic superfoods. And our actionable question for the show today is going to be, which high oxalate food should I eliminate from my diet today? Enjoy the show. Okay, good morning, Sally. Welcome to True Hope Cast. How are you? What is going well? I am wonderful. It's going well that I get to meet you and hang out with you today. That's right. And we uh, we just talked about this off air, but we're both spot, both donning this beautiful blue today. <laughs> yes, the great blue. The great blue. <laughs> well, we're going to be discussing oxalate overload and toxic superfoods today. And at the end of the podcast, we're going to be offering some solutions to the question, how can I reduce my dietary intake of toxic foods like right away so we're going to come to that at the end of the show but just as an introduction if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do i am sally norton who is this weird thing i'm an oxalate educator i'm teaching people about oxalates in their food and its effect on their health and i'm doing that because i've had a commitment to health since i was in kindergarten and decided to study nutrition to help people not get ill when i was 12. And I went to Cornell University for a nutrition degree, trying to move in that direction of a kind of preventative and holistic health and healing. But my health was not great. <laughs> Doing all the healthy things already in Cornell, I had to leave school for foot surgery. I was gone for four years and on crutches, wheelchairs, painkillers. I had arthritis. I had all these problems. I was doing plant-based, organic. I became vegan even. And, you know, I guess kept learning. I have a master's degree in public health and worked in the program of integrated medicine and know all kinds of holistic healing and have all kinds of life and professional experiences. And I did not know that my sweet potatoes and my Swiss chard, my nice organic Swiss chard that I've been growing since I was nine, that um, foods that we trust, that we think are great, are going to help us get well with the reasons I had all these health problems. Interesting. You're, yeah, you're. So when you went to study nutrition in, in the States, was your training, was it like a holistic approach? Was it quite conventional? Like, can you explain a little bit of your experience? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because my one of my major professors was the one who taught nutritional biochemistry. And he's quite interested in his own theory about how casein and dairy cause cancer potentially and was very much interested in a vegetarian and mostly a dairy-free vegetarian diet. And so we had, and this was the era when the Dietetics Association, as they were called back then, was developing an arm that said it's okay to be vegetarian. Up to then, for about the 50 years prior, they assumed that everyone needed animal foods in their diet which is probably right. But in the era I went, this was the post 1970s and early 80s. It was fashionable now to do plant-based eating. So I took a summer class at Cornell that was Diet for a Small Planet, which is read the book that I'd already read and just accept everything that it said. I got a Cornell credit. We didn't look at the actual research. We didn't question or discuss the, the thoughts put forward in that book. So it was very pro sloppiness. (laughs) <laughs> interesting yeah it's funny that at certain ages especially younger ages when we are you know we're 18 19 and we've got this new independence usually away from home going to a university and then we start learning all these things in a school facility or we start reading the books that were recommended and how much of that we we take up as gospel like straight away without really asking questions or digging deeper or um questioning the authority of the of the lecturer or the instructor it, it, it's very interesting we do that because those individuals will certainly have 
their own books that they prefer. There's no way everyone can read all of the research and read all of the science and make a, you know, a, a decision on that. So it's very much a little bit of a, a biased view, I guess, from, from anybody when it comes to nutrition, given your own personal circumstance. So yeah, that's an, it's an interesting time. So how did you, um, develop your understanding from school from those books that you're introduced to to you know, i guess where you are now well at cornell we knew that about oxalates you get mentioned mentioned in the textbook and mentioned probably in class and what we were told is that it chelates calcium and reduces the calcium availability from your foods so that you shouldn't have tea for example which is a high oxalate food or spinach necessarily with a meal where you're expecting to get calcium from it at the time Dairy products and calcium were riding high as they should be as an important nutrient. And so we were warned about that, that, you know, and the tannins and tea is similar problems. So probably you shouldn't have your tea with your meal. That's about all I came away with, except for knowing that a diet that pays attention to oxalates and limits your oxalate exposure is critical to kidney stone patients and people with chronic kidney disease. We knew that too. So I always thought of the oxalate as for kidney stone patients, nothing else. Interesting. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, let's take a step back here for a lot of people who might not have gone to nutrition school. Let's <laughs> let's tell us what, what are oxalates, please. Oxalates is a group of compounds that is based on oxalic acid, which is a two carbon molecule that has four oxygens on it and a negative charge and maybe two negative charges because it has the potential for two. And it tends to devolve into two and drop that extra hydrogen molecule or proton. And collect minerals and it, these minerals form these little molecules that salt out, so to speak, they start collecting to each other and become crystals. So when you get a, a kidney stone, it's primarily made of oxalate crystals that have grabbed calcium and your doctor will call it a calcium stone, but you can't make calcium clump together without oxalate doing it. Well, so and there's other yeah. ways your body can produce calcium elsewhere, but oxalate turns out to have a role in that. So this thing that's grabbing minerals is charged. It's um, It's got this reactivity and messes up membranes and it does a lot of problems with cells. That's the oxalic acid. That's a free ion that's floating in things like almond milk, spinach, smoothies, chocolate bars, you name it. And the plants are making this. This is not something that we spray on because it's a pesticide or something. This is natural. Nature makes it. It's a very easy to make degenerative product that comes from the oxidation process. Plants make it. One way they make it is they make vitamin C first. Vitamin C very easily degenerates into oxalate. So the plants will make oxalic acid in order to manage calcium and builds crystals, deliberate crystals in deliberate shapes for its needs. So you're also eating, when you eat plants that contain oxalic acid, you're also eating calcium oxalate crystals. That's that's super interesting because I think not a lot of people think about why plants make what they make. They're not making it for us to consume to get nutrients. It's just a that's just a, a a benefit that we get. But plants are obviously making chemicals all of the time, whether they're to create structure, to create the flowers, to to deter predators, etc. Like plants do a lot of incredible things with chemistry to evolve themselves. And I guess it only makes sense that not all of those chemicals would sit well within within the human body you know there are certainly plants that deer eat and there are certainly plants that deers don't eat and they realize that because it doesn't sit well within their bodies whether it makes them feel ill or sick or whatever but we obviously as a human species we consume foods and it interacts with us and it causes disease like the stones you're talking about is a primary example of that so is it the oxalates that we're consuming that they kind of act as this I don't know, glue that, that pulls minerals in and creates these structures with, within us that can end up building up to cause big problems for us. And also, we're probably not absorbing and utilizing the minerals from our diet if that's the case. That's right. It's a, the, this attraction to chemicals of the, the oxalic acid attracting to minerals, including calcium, magnesium, iron, you name it. It's occurring while you're digesting the food and it's occurring in your bloodstream and it's occurring at the cellular level. So at all levels, you could be losing minerals and collecting oxalates because the once it starts salting out, they stick. They stick to membranes. They stick to broken pieces of cells and they stick in areas that have inflammation and infection. So you start building up actually a toxic load in tissues. And this is 
not well recognized in medicine, even though we know that by the time you're middle age, you get to your 50th birthday, you have 85% chance of having obvious big crystals of calcium oxalate in your thyroid gland. It's happening to everyone. And yet medicine pretends it's not. So you never hear about it. And that accumulation of toxic particles, this is like nano and micro particles that are sharp and dangerous and stimulate the immune system, collecting in critical tissues like your bone marrow, your bones, your thyroid gland, other glands, including your pancreas and who knows what else, your reproductive tract, your tendons, your joints. Crystals in the joints are very much related to gout, arthritis, loss of integrity in the joints, meniscus tears, all kinds of connective tissue problems, potential degenerative discs, and so on. Your eyes collect it, affecting your vision. Your, you can get poor night vision, cataracts, acuity problems with your ability to see without glasses. There's so many ways that collecting oxalates and calcium oxalate crystals in your tissue is, is a bad thing. And yet it looks like that's what we do now. Humans yeah. eat enough oxalic acid that it's collecting in our tissues. Are there any benefits of oxalates? Um, there, all the benefits are conferred on the plants. <laughs> okay. It helps them <laughs> do a lot, but there's no known real benefit to having oxalate in the body. The body does make a little, the liver makes a little oxalate from hydroxyproline. That's the major amino acid that's in collagen and, and gelatin and connective tissue. And uh, some of that breakdown a little bit becomes oxalic acid. And then you're, that's why the body knows how to pee it out. The, the kidneys are quite familiar with oxalic acid and oxalates and crystals and can handle the amount your liver makes. No problem. It can handle twice the amount your body makes. If your body's healthy and has the right nutrient status and is not overly inflamed, you make about half of the oxalates that your kidneys are designed to excrete every day. So the other half is coming from your foods. But unfortunately, we tend to eat five, six, or seven times or more of the amount that we're built to handle now. Okay. So we do have mechanisms within us to handle oxalates because we endogenously produce them, I guess. Right. But yeah, as you say, we're, we're um, consuming them in our diet to, to an amount that our, the body just can't, can't handle that workload. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it, it's interesting that um, the body can exhibit the, the symptoms and, and discomfort and pain and disorder and disease of an overload like that because it can happen anywhere like you've described it can happen in the eyes it can happen all over the body and i i, I feel like things like if you're dehydrated those symptoms can you can have some symptoms manifest kind of all over the place within your gut within your skin hair etc and yeah it's, it's it's interesting that when people start to feel symptoms or start to feel like things aren't quite right with their body and they go, go to a, go to a doctor who's potentially not well versed in diet or oxalate specifically would, you know, maybe send them to a eye specialist or a skin specialist or a hair specialist, rather than looking at the fact that you know, this could just be something as simple as looking at one particular chemical that they're consuming. You know, it's just not in our thinking to think about toxicity diseases and deposition diseases where things are depositing in your tissues as a course of disease. And nowadays, the whole medical structure is looking more at managing symptoms than looking at what caused them in the first place. So root cause thinking is not really there in medicine anymore. And even lifestyle uh, contributions to disease are given like limp wristed attention because doctors assume that patients won't live the way they think they should live. And of course, right. the advice you're getting from the doctor is probably not right. That's the other thing is that these foods that have the high levels of toxic oxalates are things like spinach, beet greens, Swiss chard, things we trust, almonds, cashews, peanuts, chocolate, that chocolate's supposed to be a superfood. Bran, we've been promoting bran since the 80s. The gluten-free grains like the quinoa is so popular now. Buckwheat, teff, arrowroot, cassava is really popular as chips and so on. Like These are supposed to be great and they're full of oxalate. Chia seeds, hemp seeds, turmeric, blackberries, figs, pomegranates. These are supposed to be good for us. And no one's paying attention to the fact that they're loaded with a toxin that will slowly, silently, 
start to cause problems. And because, you know, people like me went to school for it. And I was, oh, yeah, you don't have kidney stones. You're fine. Well, that is not really how this works, which is was pretty shocking to me. It took it takes a lot to, like, get your mind to shift, so which nice. you think you know stuff. You, you listed off a bunch of foods there. Um, super common foods that I'm sure people consume on a daily basis. Are there, are there, um, are there foods in which oxalates are like in outrageous amounts? The outrageous ones are Swiss chard and beet greens, Swiss chard spinach, beet greens. almonds. And then there's ones that, you know, just because you eat it a lot becomes outrageous because mm. you're eating it every day, chocolate and potatoes and peanuts. Those are really super common. I mean, nowadays, the, the sort of nut and peanut combination with chocolate, Reese's peanut butter cups, chocolate chip cookies, like that combination is everywhere. And yeah. it's so ubiquitous that you casually grab a Hershey's Kiss and a handful of nuts or some trail mix loaded with these things. You think it's fun. You don't give it a second thought. No, I don't. I consume. I, lo I, I love my like little nut mixes when I'm out, out and about and like a, a little snack to have. When I don't have uh, my kitchen available to me, but yeah, it's yeah, that's wild that they're in so many different foods. Is there anything you can actually do to the food to reduce its oxalate amount? You can do an extract. So if you extract it with hot boiling water, you can reduce the amount of oxalate in broccoli by a half. The broccoli is a medium, not really bad, not like the spinach. If you reduce um, twenty percent out of spinach, doesn't matter. It's still ridiculously high. Yeah. So, so okay. you can reduce it in things like poi, which is a Hawaiian food, or, you know, boiling spinach for 10 minutes and turning it into absolute mush and somehow using a colander and getting the mush out, trying to eat that and throw out the water. You reduce it from maybe a thousand milligrams to maybe 700 milligrams. Well, anything over hundred milligrams is way, 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 way too much. So it doesn't matter that you reduced it because it's still ridiculous. Have you got some examples of like, like those hundred milligram foods that are quite low? Oh, you want me to know these in my head? Data in your head is not trustworthy. So anything I say from memory, just don't believe me. But um, a, a handful or an ounce of almonds is about 70 milligrams of oxalate. Okay. So, you know, two handfuls you've covered for the day. You're done eating. All right. That's, 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 that's a good thing to go by. That's a good metric also. <laughs> yeah, that's a metric for you. But yeah. if you added in some tea, you know, and some dried berries or a little spinach on your pizza or your Subway sandwich, you know, then you're way overdoing it. Yeah. What about drinks? What about coffee, tea, alcohol? Alcohol is completely pretty much empty of oxalates. There's certain fancy beers that add in things that might add a little, but alcohol, the sin foods aren't too bad. <laughs> coffee, no problem. Very low in oxalate. There's another sin food you can have. Tea, uh, black tea is pretty soluble because you're, you're making this extract with the, something about this plant allows that, that oxalate to come out of the leaves when you make the tea and you're getting very soluble oxalate from tea. So tea is a pretty good source of oxalate, but mild at 20 milligrams per cup. Um, so you can have a little tea if you're getting rid of the French fries and the tater tots and the potato chips and the Reese's peanut butter cups and the handfuls of nuts and the spinach smoothies and all that quinoa and bran and chia. Like if you can get rid of some of that stuff, you can have your tea. Usually. What about, what about animal based products? They eat animal products really yeah. don't have oxalate in them. There may be a little traces here and there. There hasn't been a lot of tests of seafood. There might be a little trace in some seafood, but no, that, it's really a plant product. Animal flesh does not want a toxin, does not need a toxin. We are the predators. We're not supposed to use toxins in ourselves in order to prevent being eaten, mm -hmm. unlike plants. Do anim this, this is probably getting off topic a bit, but do, do animals, or other, other animals that consume vegetables and, um, and plants, do they have a better mechanism of dealing with them or do they just consume foods that instinctively that are quite low? Well, in animal husbandry, we see this with sheep and cattle where they can die from oxalates in the forage. So if they're sent out in a field that's mostly weeds that are high oxalate weeds and they're not used to it, mm -hmm. they'll get sick and die and have miscarriages and really get, horses get something called big head. I mentioned that in my book, Toxic Superfoods, as an okay. example of how this works. And it's really interesting because, of course, the horse is monogastric and, and not a ruminant. And the ruminant animals, which are the elk and the deer and the cattle and, and the lambs and so on, the sheep, they have a four-chamber digestion. And there's this, all this bacteria turning 
indigestible cellulose into basically dead bacteria. So they live on dead bacteria and get that protein and build big bodies. Mm -hmm. And those bacteria can adjust based on the diet. So if they get into some oxalate forages, they can eventually grow more bacteria. So during their digestion, their tolerance for the higher oxalate plants improves, but they have to be introduced to these high oxalate plants gradually. Um, but we are not for chambered animals. We absorb oxalate from the stomach and the upper small intestine. It floats between the cells in the water. And a healthy stomach doesn't have a lot of bacteria in it. The bacteria are really concentrated down in the colon. And the bacteria in the colon, there's some, um, I believe they're anaerobic bacteria. But most of the colon prefers anaerobic bacteria. This is this... Um, Oxalobacter fermentages, which is an oxalate degrading bacteria that can help your body excrete oxalate that's already in your bloodstream back into the colon and they will eat it and remove it. So the bacteria helps you remove it, especially when the kidneys are unhappy and your system's acidic, but it doesn't prevent you from absorbing it and already messing with your blood cells and your vascular system and potentially your liver and your critical organs. So the bacteria are important to us. You can see it in the cattle and so on where they can die if they're not well managed. Interesting. Interesting. Um, that, what are the, some of the signs that someone has an oxalate overload or that could potentially be the cause of some of their symptoms? Well, initially you usually don't get symptoms or symptoms that you recognize. Now, if you're eating an acute meal, you know, a smitted smoothie or a dinner full of sweet potatoes and Swiss chard, like I used to eat, Three or four hours later, you might not be feeling so great. You might have a stomach thing, a little bloating. You might get some hiccups or some belching or have trouble sleeping. And those could be signs. Digestive problems almost always show up when there is an oxalate problem. And some people get metabolic problems where they have trouble with energy and they're fatigued or their problems with weight, weight gain. But mostly it's going to be aches and pains, headaches, sleep problems, mood changes, irritability, anxiety, depression, apathy. You may get aches and pains in the joints and muscles and end up with something like arthritis, gout, or fibromyalgia. Uh, you could have urinary tract problems where you're waking up at night. You see cloudy urine. That can be crystals forming in the urine. It shows up where you can see this kind of thickness to the urine where it looks like you can't see through it very well. Um you can get bladder sensitivity where you have to, like bladder starts bothering you and waking you up at night or having you run to the bathroom for a tablespoon of urine and you're trotting to the john too often. So there's a urinary tract, there's a nervous system where you get changes in your nerves and headaches and aches and pains. And then there's the, the connective tissues mess up. You can start needing glasses too early in life like I did. Start having tooth pain, tooth sensitivity. It goes on and on and on. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it could kind of pop up for anyone anywhere. And I guess mm -hmm. taking them out of the diet for, well, I mean, how long would you say if, you, if you're if you listening to this podcast and you eat a bunch of the foods that we've spoken about, like in quite high amounts, as you say, like your book's called Toxic Superfood. So it's, it's very fascinating that we, some of those foods that we consider to be super healthy for us are like probably hurting a lot of people. What do you, um, yeah, what would you say in regards to, how long would it take for you to maybe start seeing a benefit or seeing su subtle changes in, in within somebody once they start taking out some of these foods? Well, it's interesting because there's the concern that if you have been living on spinach smoothies and chia bowls and bran and lots of almonds or keto diets that's loaded with almond flour, almond paste, almond this, almond that, you know, you could be sitting on a mother load. And me, it was the sweet potatoes. I was using sweet potatoes as a daily bread. I'd have them for breakfast, usually have some with dinner. I like to have Swiss chard a few nights a week. That is enough. Or if you're just a chocolaholic, or if you're into peanut butter and everything, you know, some people get this thing with certain foods. You could be sitting on a mess and not know it. And the general advice is to just remove one of these foods at a time and go slowly because if you abruptly change, you'll probably feel okay. In fact, feel really good for three days. And then you're at risk for the body suddenly letting loose on the stuff you recently ate or whatever and start flooding your bloodstream and your kidneys and so on with oxalate from the past. 
and you're you're haunted by these old ghosts of the past and it can really cause problems so you might get this honeymoon where the body's like getting ready to get rid of the oxalates from the tissues and feel great and then you could feel worse so there's no guarantee that you're going to feel better but if you do it right you can learn how to manage that but if you do have a funny response to changing your diet you know this is a real thing for you yeah, we see we have a we have a product here at True Hope called Olive Leaf, Olive Leaf Extract, and does a bunch of amazing things. But we see it work really work work really well for for Candida, and we see it. We have to tell people to go slow with the product because it will get rid of it. But if you use too much too early, you'll see this die off within your own body that floods your system and can give you like cold and flu symptoms. So, I guess yeah, if you do have a large buildup of these these oxalates sure you want to get rid of them but you have to be responsible in the way that you do that you don't want this big flood coming into your body and your immune system engaging with that at a high level so that's there yeah, that's really really good advice just just a quick one off the cuff like what's the what's a good substitute for like spinach smoothies from a nutritional standpoint well if you want to do a, anything with greens in it start using romaine lettuce and other lettuces and watercress and arugula and then if you want cooked greens do turnip tops and mosh and do uh you know collards so those things are all pretty low even kale yeah. is relatively low quite low compared to spinach so it's really just the three greens the spinach you know if it's if happy if a happy body and great vision and energy and happy joints and good reproduction if the only thing standing between you and it is spinach spinach has got to go <laughs> there's a lot of greens out there that's for there's sure a lot of greens out there yeah good i mean it's funny we're, we're just we're just creatures of habit so we'll just shop in the same spots go to the same people at the farmer's market and buy kind of the same things all the time but it's literally hundreds tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of different plants out there that are edible so right. there's there's, cer there's certainly options and i think it's i think it's good to uh open up your horizons when it comes to exactly to food yeah, exactly. true what you touched on it briefly but like what's the um conventional understanding of oxalates is there one like is it taught in medical school do you know if you go to the doctor and i and if i now if i said you know i'm having problems with my eyes or something like that like then they're, they're very rarely they're going to ask about diet and i'm going to end up telling them about the three green smoothies of spinach that i have every day like that's never really going to come up like <laughs> what's the what's the conventional understanding Oh man, it, it is bleak right now because there's lots of denial that this is even an issue. Mm -hmm. You can take the calcium oxalate crystals that are coming out of your eye fluids and a lot of people see incredible, like big chunky stuff yeah. coming out of their, somewhere near their eyes. You can get this crust in your eyes. This is coming out. Your eyes can be glued shut in the morning <laughs> and this stuff is like glued on your cheek. And This stuff is there and you could take these chunks of calcium or whatever it is your eye doctor and see these are coming out of my eye fluids now wow they will be like oh that's just some old calcium well who cares about that they're not interested in going hmm interesting how and why so they absolutely have no interest in it and no knowledge of it it's interesting how little of it is in the ophthalmology literature they learn nothing about this and so we're learning as a community because there's tens of thousands of us picking up this information and we're seeing, I'm seeing very clearly with people who have brain and central nervous system issues or water on the brain or other things, they're just pouring. Once they stop eating this stuff, the body's like finally able to let it go because mm -hmm. it's been holding on to it because the inflood has been so overwhelming every day for years. The, how much of this junk is coming out of their eyes? But conventional medicine shows no interest so far. But we're going to change that because more and more people in conventional medicine are doing these mistakes for themselves. And once they find it in their own bodies, in their own families, things are going to change. I, I, I find it interesting. I, I've made a couple of like big dietary changes in my like 30 years of like, oh my God, I'm not 30, I'm 40. My 40 <laughs> years of being alive. Um, and it's not about like what I start eating. Like, and I think that's what we misunderstand with diets. It's not like necessarily what you're eating on that diet. That's, that's help helping you or harming you, whatever. Right. But it's what you're not eating. So, you know, if you're not eating the seed oils, if you're not eating the, the processed sugars, that's what, you know, that's what your body is thriving on and feeling better on. Cause it's not having to deal with that toxic 
rubbish anymore you know it's able to actually thrive so yeah i find that interesting i don't think we really have the understanding from a conventional standpoint that the the things that we aren't eating is actually what's going to actually benefit us and when we're talking about something like spinach as well which i assume everyone assumes is, is super super healthy for you and everyone should be consuming it and it's what's interesting is that we have such depleted soil so our fruits and vegetables are like even more depleted of, of vital nutrients so we like eat even more of it now like you it's so very unhelpful when it comes to, to that and i yeah i hope that like individuals like yourself and you said that there's ten, tens thousands of people in the community that can you know, start helping people um understand a little bit about how you know some superfoods aren't that super they're not and I, I like that you bring up this concept that taking things away is powerful medicine in in our modern western culture it's always about buying a new supplement adding this and that buying a new exercise equipment joining the gym like doing more buying more you know and sometimes it's really just a matter of stopping. It sure is. Yeah. Well, um, how do you think we can bring a little bit more awareness of, of oxalates into the conversation? Because from what I understand before speaking to you and I learned I, now I know even more root cause healing is obviously a big topic for let's say can, unconventional practitioners you know they want to get to the root cause of people's concerns or issues whether that's physiological or psychological it's obviously very important to understand like what's the root causing the problem where do you think the awareness is going to start coming from with with oxalates well it's really interesting because a few years ago no one ever heard the word oxalate and it seems that the minute somebody picks it up and really experience it for themselves they can't not help someone else with it. It's been so powerful in their lives. Even if their daughter or mother or sister or neighbor won't listen, they'll tell the guy in the produce aisle, hey, guy, don't buy that spinach. Buy this other stuff instead. This is better. So word is getting out. And you can see that with how the book sales are doing. And you can see that in the community. So there's a natural word of mouth where we're spreading something on a grassroots level. So I think the most important thing is to find open-minded people who see a need for some new options in their life and see how simple it is. What a simple concept to quit the almonds and chocolate potatoes and spinach for a while and see if you notice anything, mm. see what you can learn from that. It's so important that we do that because without this awareness, what we have is a world that's pushing these foods on young people, on pregnant women, on newborns, on weaning children, like there's too much of this oxalate everywhere and it's too accepted. So it's really important that people like yourself are talking about it. And I think these conversations has done a tremendous amount to get people to think, yeah, maybe I should think about this. <laughs> Where is most of the kickback coming from against this movement? Well, personally, I don't spend any time looking for kickbacks, so I'm not the most the best expert for that. I spend my time helping people. Great. And but I know that anyone who's already embedded in pushing these foods and have some investment in it intellectually, emotionally, socially, financially. Financially. Yeah. Because ultimately you don't want to upset the income stream. And that, that can be very subtle. It could be about your tenure. You know, it's not that subtle, sure. <laughs> you know? but you know, what I'm finding is people that are already stuck in mainstream ideas and embedded in institutions in our universities and our medical system in um, online coaching or whatever, they're already so devoted to how that's working out for them that new truths are not necessarily um, going to be accepted. So people are, making up alternate facts pretty quickly, even in the keto world and so on, and mm -hmm. making up facts about, oh, if you just get enough bacteria, that'll do it, and publishing articles and saying that, but that doesn't make it true. I just want to play devil's advocate for a second and ask you, what's the what are the differences between toxic superfoods and um, oxalate, and then all the other trendy diets that we've seen forever? <laughs> I know it, right? So uh, there's a new diet of the week. <laughs> and here's yet another thing you're not supposed to be doing. 
where's room for this in the whole map of things? It's ridiculous. And I'm like, oh man, I have to join the fray and be talking about <laughs> stuff that's bad for you. That's right. the last thing I wanted to do. I'm like, I never wanted to take food away from anybody. That's why I work in academia where I don't have to one-on-one -on -one say, you know, don't eat this. Like, I don't want to be your nanny and tell you what to eat. But what's important is to live our truth and to realize that we can help each other. And I realized that I couldn't figure this out. I had all these friends in holistic healing and medicine and a lifetime of education. And this was my career. And I was eating these sweet potatoes every day and could not tell that was what was ruining my life. I couldn't sleep and didn't know it. My brain was waking up 29 times an hour. Mm. I had to quit my university position because I could no longer function. My brain couldn't put words together. I couldn't read my mail. I'm laying on the sofa. My life was over. And there I am still eating my sweet potatoes thinking that's okay. So I couldn't figure it out. And I felt like, you know, anybody could be making this mistake. And nowadays we're all kind of making this mistake. It's up to me to let anyone who's looking for another answer know. And that's all I personally care about. If someone needs an answer, I'm saying, this is an important thing to know about. If you like to know about it, great. But when people put out disinformation to try to cancel people's options and limit how many options they have to try for their own health, that's almost criminal. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And I see some really interesting um just from working with true hope and my understanding of minerals our, our primary product here is a broad spectrum micronutrient formula that is chelated for for four days so it's absorbed through the blood-brain barrier and is actually actually a supplement a primary mi mineral supplements actually absorbed and utilized through the body and we see well i've seen the last eight years i've worked for this company how nutrient mineral deficient a lot of people are especially people who are suffering from anxiety depression um, even to the even to the cases of like you know bipolar disorder, people are so depleted that their brains are unable to function correctly. And there's a, obviously a huge connection with what we're talking about right now with you know oxalates binding minerals, making them unabsorbable, and turning them into kind of weapons or bombs waiting to go off. And the more people consume consume these different types of foods, and they become more nutrient deficient, that produces more symptomology more oxalates, more symptomology, you know, it's a, it's a vicious roundabout. And it's so aligned in regards to what we see with mental health when people start to consume a product that's actually getting minerals into their body rather being um, bound up, um, how powerful that can be for a lot of people. So I really appreciate that you've come on and you're obviously so motivated to spread the word on this. And thank you for coming onto the show to, to do that because it really does align with the fact that we see so many people when they become nutrient sufficient, their lives change very, very fast. It's incredible. Oxalate is the reason, the major reason why we're all mineral deficient. We are all in trouble with minerals. In some of my clients, it, you can really see it with all kinds of symptoms arrhythmia, osteoporosis, <laughs> stomach problems, all these mood problems you're talking about. Absolutely. Oxalate is draining us of minerals and causing oxidative stress and inflammation and mitochondrial pore function and vascular pore function and critical organ problems and body in integration problems. Mm -hmm. The minerals are a major piece. Before we jump into the kind of the final question, um, that we spoke about at the top of the show. Is there anything in conjunction with just removing these oxalate foods that we can, that we can do to, to, to benefit ourselves? And I, I just kind of think of um, so many people have got gut problems, whether that's leaky gut or they've got just um, an in inadequate ability to, to, to break down food and absorb it. What are some of the key things that other people can do that, that people can do to, to accompany reducing their oxalate? consumption when it comes to chronic digestive problems and inflammation in the gut oddly enough getting rid of fiber can be a huge benefit at least for a while and then if we can figure out how to fix the imbalance of microbes in the gut which is i think there's new ideas coming down the pike that's going to yeah. help us with that because probiotics just aren't able to cut it really we're quite sick um but getting the electrolytes right is helpful so adding some supplements that provide potassium, magnesium, and calcium, and trace minerals is important. It's going to help that 
those nerves work better. And then you have better peristalsis, better relaxation of the sphincter. So you're less likely to have acid reflux and diarrhea and constipation, all those things. So getting enough minerals, getting rid of the fiber, and that means more animal products. So adding more meats and animal products, they're very nutri nutritional. Egg yolks are very easy to digest. So if you can't digest, usually an undercooked or even raw egg yolk, you can digest. So there's, there's ways... But this is like consulting because each person needs their own individual path to get well. 100%, yeah. But getting rid of things like um, the, the uh, emulsifiers in food, they're quite harsh on the gut. So these emulsifiers and additives, the sodium benzoate, all these chemicals are in commercial foods. And the seed oils, you got to get rid of that stuff and really eat real food from scratch. You know, food you could go catch on a farm. <laughs> start eating more like that and learn the simple techniques to cook real food and not be relying on commercial foods and eating out so much and then really get your oxalate lenses on and start paying attention to that oxalate lenses are like that um i'm going to change the question um for the end of the show because i think i i think we've covered so much in regards to how we can reduce um dietary intake of toxic food so i would love you to just answer this question for me if you don't mind which three foods that are so high in oxalates should we just get rid of immediately and not consume almond milk almond butter almond everything plus the spinach and the swiss chard those would be my top favorite ones to get rid of and then there's the potato chip and the french fry all right wonderful what about um like milk alternatives like to almond milk like, would oat be a better option our best option is probably coconut based coconut okay mm -hmm. awesome well that's incredible information sally thank you so much i learned a heck of a lot and i'm sure everyone listening and watching will do as well what is the best way that people can connect with you to learn more sallyknorton.com is my website at sallyknorton.com you can write to us there you can get all kinds of free information you can get a link to join a group class. You can learn about the book, Toxic Superfoods. You can learn about the data companion, which goes with the book if you're really interested in studying the, how much oxalate and, and everything. But you really should start with Toxic Superfoods. There's a cookbook there you can get. There's a link to the um, my YouTube channel, which is also Sally K. Norton. So the YouTube channel has lovely little shorts. You might find a way to share that. I'm hoping the YouTube channel will allow you to move this message forward. If you have a friend, a relative, a daughter, neighbor, one minute videos, you might be able to use those or these little 15 minute testimonials as a way to like open your eyes like, wow, you can heal your knees without surgery. <laughs> That's pretty fun. Amazing. Well, I'll make sure that um, links to your YouTube channel and your website and social media are all available in the description of, of, of the podcast. But Sally, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're a blessing. And I'm glad that you're out there doing what you're doing. You are too, Simon. It's really lovely to be with you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that is it for this episode of True Hope Cast, the official podcast of True Hope Canada. For any information or any, any links that we've um, discussed will be in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe. You can leave us a review if you want to as well. Um, but that is it for this week. We'll see you soon.